Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening's webinar. Um, I will just give us a few minutes while we just wait for, um, for everyone to come trickling in. So just bear with us a couple of seconds. Okay, we seem to have sort of leveled out there. So we'll get going as we're already a couple of minutes past half past. So uh, my name's Harriet. I work for the Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust. And this evening we are joined by Anthony and Becky from the Rutland uh, local group. Uh, Anthony is um, live from our volunteer training centre where he's joined by a few other members from the Rutland local group as well. And then uh, we've also got Claire Sambridge who is one of our conservation officers. Um, I'll pass over to Anthony in a moment to introduce Claire and get this evening um, uh, uh, going. Um, but before we do, just um, a couple of things to go over. So if anyone has any questions throughout the webinar, please just pop a question in the Q&A box and then we'll go through them with Claire at the end of the talk. Um, we're delighted to be able to offer these talks for free, but if you would like to give a donation to support the work of um, the Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust and help us to continue to put on these talks, please head to our website at lrwt.org.uk forward slash donate and I'll pop that in the chat box as well. Um, and that's it, I think. So without further ado, um, I'll pass over to Anthony. Thanks very much, Harriet. And um, welcome everybody joining us live at the VTC. Now it would have worked quite well. We've got it all set up to um, project the screen onto the, um, project the laptop onto the screen, which worked perfectly well until about five minutes before I came on, and then everything went black. However, there aren't very many of us here, so we're gathered around various laptops on, um, on chairs at the VTC, but it's, um, it, it's an interesting, uh, interesting exercise. Like everything else, it worked well in rehearsal, <laughs> and it crashes on the night. Anyway, very warm welcome um, this evening. We're particularly pleased because this is the first um, indoor meeting of the autumn season of our group, uh, and we're very uh, pleased that Claire Sambridge, one of the reserve team at, uh, at Leicester, who's been really um, involved very much in uh, projects with the, um, the, the Saw and the Reek Valley. And she's going to describe to us her work and her aspirations in the future. So I'm going to hand you over to Claire. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you. Uh, I'm honoured to be kicking off the autumn season. Uh, it is a great honour and thank you very much for the welcome. Let me just get my screen share underway uh, and then I can introduce myself properly. Um, as with all these things, uh, it just takes a moment or two to come along and get itself set up. Maybe Anthony, can you give me a thumbs up that you can see that on the screen? Yes, Brilliant. this is fine. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, yeah, as Anthony said, my name is Claire Sandbridge. I'm a conservation officer at Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust. Just a little bit of background about myself. Um, I've only been with the Trust since January this year. Um, I joined in lockdown, so it's taken me a little bit of time to get up to speed on all things Leicestershire and Rutland. But before that, I was at Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust, so I haven't moved far um, and the counties are bordering uh, and there's some kind of crossovers, so I don't feel like it's all completely new to me. But what I'm going to do this evening is talk about the Saw and Reek living landscape uh, and how we might take a landscape approach um, to help boost nature's recovery uh, in this area. Now, the state of nature from 2019 doesn't, um, doesn't paint a great picture for the UK. Uh, and this is the figures from England um, since 1970. We're looking at a 35% decrease in species. Uh, and we're looking at 31% of our wildlife found in fewer places. And there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, it's not just one reason, that there are many reasons. Uh, and if you look on the right hand side, I hope you can see there. Um, climate change is one of those reasons, urbanization, pollution, how we manage or don't manage our woodlands, how we manage our fisheries, species that are invasive and non-native, 
our freshwater management and our agriculture. And that's really quite a key one that we'll be looking at, um, how we balance, uh, how we produce um, nutritious, sustainable, uh, enough food, uh, but balance that with uh, sustaining our natural environment as well. So the state of nature isn't brilliant when you look at uh, the big picture. But at the Wildlife Trust as a whole, um, we have got this vision um, of Britain in 2040, um, which is greener, healthier and happier, uh, a vision of, of a place where nature is normal. Um, our housing developments and other developments um, have that green element to them, um, where wildlife is intertwined throughout. Our cities are wilder, our countryside's buzzing again with insect life. The fisheries are more sustainable. We might even see whales back in our coastal waters. Soils are more fertile and our uplands have been restored. Uh, and this is a vision that's gonna take more space for nature. Um, so more of our land needs to be making, uh, making uh, its work for nature uh, and also more people involved in taking regular action. And those two things we'll kind of explore in a bit more detail. So one of the concepts I just wanted to talk to you about uh, to start with um, is this idea of bigger, better, more connected. Uh, and this is very much synonymous with the soil and living landscape. And it's a concept um, that was first proposed um, by somebody called Professor Sir John Lawton in a review that he wrote in 2010 for the government called Making Space for Nature. Uh, and it's the approach, as I explain it, is not new. It's something the Wildlife Trust has been working on for some time, um, but this really brought it to the forefront. Uh, and the idea starts where you know, you've got these core sites. So, for example, you've got a tree that in itself supports a range of species, it might be bats or birds, insects. And it's great in itself, but it can't do everything on its own. It's kind of isolated and it's only one tree. So the idea is we want to make that bigger. So maybe we have more trees around it. And to make it better, um, perhaps we have uh, a buffer habitat around that. So now we've got a woodland. So we've gone from one tree to a woodland to a woodland with maybe some scrub and some grass around it. And um, so it's bigger and it's better, there's more of it. But then the final piece of the puzzle is these have to be connected. Um, so we've got these core sites dotted around the countryside. Maybe think of them like our nature reserves. Um, but what we need to do is not just treat these in isolation. We need to connect them up. And what we might do is put stepping stones in the landscape. So it might be trees or individual kind of copses of woodland um, that connect the larger core sites. We might be able to do a corridor. So this might be a grassland corridor or it might be a hedgerow um, that helps connect our sites. We might actually be able to fill in some of the gaps completely with woodland and surrounding habitat. And these things are bigger, better and more connected. And then what we have to add into the final piece of the picture is the people. Um, as I said at the start, we want more land for nature, but we want more people taking action. And that could be people using our um, nature areas for recreation, enjoying them and all the well-being benefits that that can bring. Could be people who are joining in and helping us manage those sites. Uh, and it could be uh, young people, children and adults learning about nature and, and using these sites uh, and connecting up in that way uh, and finding out more about nature and wildlife uh, and the sort of actions that we can take. So if you put all these things together, this is what we mean by a living landscape. And so hopefully that sets the scene when I'm starting to talk about the sort and reek living landscape, that I'm talking about the habitats themselves and their connectivity, but we're also talking about how people connect with the landscape and that those elements are really key. And this is part of the Wildlife Trust's vision, and the Wildlife Trust as a whole, the movement that we're a part of. Um, and we know that we're losing wildlife and wild places at an alarming rate. Um, but this idea of a living landscape is a landscape scale approach. We have to think bigger uh, and we have to be um, better at it and more joined up. Um, so we've got people in there uh, and we've got living landscapes and living seas, not quite so relevant in Leicestershire and Rutland being landlocked, um, but the wildlife just do come around the coasts as well. So. Um, this is all, all part of the Wildlife Trust vision. It also matches in with the UK government approach. You may have heard of this idea of a nature recovery network. And you can probably see the synergy there with the living landscape, that it's about connectivity, a system of joined up places where nature can recover and thrive. And it's places that are already um, there and valuable, but there's also aspirations for where we might be able to enhance habitat or create new habitat um, to make more connections uh, and really kind of increase the connectivity of our habitats. Uh, and this will help us um, in a face of changing climate, because um, as climate changes, as climate perhaps warms, some of our species that are currently in the south of the country, for example, might find that as the climate warms, it's too warm for them. 
and they need connectivity to be able to migrate towards the north where it might still be a little bit cooler. Uh, and if they can't migrate, um, then we will lose those species. Um, so it's about increasing resilience in the face of climate change um, as well. This also came out um, within the government's 25-year uh, environment plan. We're building on that. There's lots of exciting things in the pipeline at the moment with the new environment bill you might have heard of and um, that we should be bringing in um, really just more um, protection and more impetus on, on what's going on and bringing the environment into everything we do, uh, in particular in um, enhancing the planning process and how that might turn out for, for nature conservation. We're bringing it back to the soil and reef living landscape. Um, so I just wanted to set the scene of that kind of bigger picture uh, and then we'll bring it back down to the soil and reef living landscape. So hopefully you can see this map okay. Uh, and this is a map of the saw catchment. You might think it looks a bit like the county of Leicestershire um, and it's very similar, but this is the saw catchment. And a catchment is just a boundary um, that isn't a political boundary or an administrative boundary, but it actually follows how water moves across the landscape. So everything within that larger gray area there, um, all the water in there ends up in the rivers that are in the saw catchment. Um, so everything outside of that boundary, the water will actually be flowing in different directions, northeast, southwest, um, but everything in that catchment um, will all be part of the same river system. So we've got Leicester in there, we've got Loughborough in there, we've got Melton Mowbray. And then the rivers within that, um, I kind of think of them as arteries and veins. Um, actually, when you see this picture, you realise how much of our landscape is dominated by larger rivers, but then smaller rivers and streams and the little tributaries. And then if you look uh, a bit closer, what you'll see is the darker lines in purple there. So running from the south is the River Saw itself that runs through Leicester and then carries on to the north past Loughborough. And then coming in from the east, um, we've got the River Eye, but then once it comes through Melton Mowbray, it becomes the Reek, and then that joins in with the Saw and around the Cossington area just above Leicester there. So all the water in the Saw and the Reek catchments will be either heading towards the north or towards the west and then go northwest um, where it meets the Trent um, up and just into Derbyshire actually at Longington. So in terms of the soil and reek living landscape, the soil catchment itself is huge. Um, so from the perspective of the Wildlife Trust and trying to decide how we can make the most impact, we've kind of just drilled down into that soil catchment and, and looked at possibly the, the key river corridors um, of the soil and reek themselves. And in dark blue there you can see that's the soil and reek floodplain, so that's the immediate areas that as the rivers rise, if there's a heavy rainfall, that's the immediate floodplain of the rivers. Uh, and then we've got an extra kind of bit in purple there that gives us a bit of flexibility um, to look at the, you know, the immediate environment around that floodplain. Uh, and this is our starting focus for the soil and reef living landscape. Doesn't mean that we can't look outside of that. Um, as I said, the whole catchment is connected from a hydrological perspective. Um, but this gives us a starting focus of the habitats and the species that we, we really want to be focusing on um, and, and trying to help nature to recover within this broad area. So remember that purple Y shape um, because we'll be coming back to it as we move through the presentation. Now what I wanted to do as well is take a step back and think about where we are in that wider network. Um, so this is a bit of a more complicated slide but hopefully I can talk you through it. So the map on the left there, hopefully you can see that purple Y shape um, in the bottom there. And so that's the soil catchment. And as I said, all the water um, from the soil is is heading towards the north and west and it joins that large sort of um, broad green line uh, and that line is the River Trent and so if you look over to the left it starts at Spoke-on-Trent, winds its way past Stafford uh, and then up and around past Derby and through the centre of Nottingham, Newark, Gainsborough and up out to, to Sunthorpe and out into the Hong Restuary. So that's the Trent. So all the water in our catchment in the Saw ends up in the Trent but everything that happens kind of on an upstream of that Will also be impacting the trend further downstream. So the water um, from the Birmingham area, that's the rivers Tame, Anchor and Mies, um, the upper um, trend catchment around Stafford, then there's the Derbyshire Derwent and the Dove, uh, and all of those and the soil catchment all kind of come in and start one wending their way through Nottinghamshire, towards the north of Nottinghamshire, the rivers uh, Morn, Meaden, the Poulter and the Idle, um, and then that uh, runs up the River Torn comes in at the top there, and we're all out into the top of the, uh, into the, top of the catchment, um, out into Hunger Estuary. So the soil and reek living landscape is the, is the top of a really kind of wide pyramid. And anything that we can do to benefit water and species will help this whole network, this really kind of broader network in the Hunger Estuary. 
um, in the Hunger River Basin District uh, is what it's called um, when we look at it on this scale. Um, so the water that leaves us, um, if we can make it in as best condition as possible, um, then that will have a positive impact on everything downstream. Uh, and if we can make our part of the network as good as it can be, that will contribute to this overall network of river systems. Now, because we're talking to the Rutland local group today, I thought that you'd be interested to know where, you're, where you are in this, where Rutland is in this. So I've taken to focus, um, those red dots in the middle is, is um, the Bestia and Rutland Wildlife Trust reserves in the, um, in the area that you're in. So hopefully you can see the larger red areas, that's where Rutland water is. Uh, and in Rutland, um, this actually sits in a different river catchment and the water flows quite differently. So we've talked about the saw kind of rising north and west uh, and the reek coming in. Um, and then um, all the water there going out into the Trent at Long Eaton. But in the Welland catchment, which is where Rutland water is part of, um, actually the water goes out to the east uh, and meets the wash. So all the water in that green portion area of the Welland catchment, so um, the water that comes past Rutland water, um, all the rivers and streams there are actually running in a different direction. A lot of the challenges will be similar um, to, to those faced in the Saw and Reek. There will be some differences and there will be different urban centres, different land uses, um, but it's quite interesting that actually the water um, will kind of meet the, the sea out, at, um, out in the wash uh, much more rapidly um, from the Welland catchment. But I just thought I'd put that into context for you, but obviously we're focusing on the, the Saw and Reek living landscape today. So we've set out some objectives for the soil and reef living landscape and hopefully I'll take you through what I mean by all of these things um, and it helps us to focus on what is it we want, what in the bottom line in every activity that we're trying to do that I'm trying to help um, people in the trust achieve and um, what are our overarching objectives and we'll go through each of these in turn but we're looking at rivers and tributaries to be in a better condition. We want our core sites um, to be better buffered and better connected, that's those Lawton principles we were talking about. We want our priority habitats created and enhanced, and I'll talk through how we select priority habitats. Priority species thriving, uh, and our communities just better connected up and all the benefits that go with um, people and their connection to nature. So the first one I want to talk about is rivers in better condition. Uh, and this, the picture isn't brilliant. So in the UK, we've lost 90% of our wetland habitats in the last 100 years. Only 16% of our water bodies are anywhere close to being in a natural state. Over 10% of our freshwater and wetland species are threatened with extinction. 40% of water bodies are not good, and that means that's classification under the Water Framework Directive, um, but they're physically modified. Um, vast majority of catchments are disconnected from the floodplain because of different structures, weirs and dams and things like that. There are 73,000 structures on our river and 20% of the modifications that some of these structures serve no longer serve a purpose. And this is the picture nationally. But if we look at the River Saw, and there's a group who meet regularly of different organisations called the River Saw Catchment Partnership. Uh, and they've identified uh, a number of reasons why um, our rivers aren't in a good condition uh, and things that we need to address. So they're no, not really any different from the national picture. Um, but they've identified in the Soil Catchment Partnership um, that pollution's a big issue, that barriers in the river are a big issue. If our fish can't migrate up and down the river, that will impact on their breeding cycle. Um, flooding, um, we've kind of avoided uh, various news reports about flooding over, over the last few years, um, seems to be getting worse with more extreme weather, and flooding in and around the Soil Catchment is a problem as well. Modification, as I've talked about, the Soil is quite unique in that um, it's kind of part of the Grand Union Canal. And so there's areas where the saw is part of the navigation channel uh, and the canal kind of meets it and then they diverge again and then they converge. So um, there's lots of modified structures um, on the saw, particularly through Leicester. This connection from the floodplain, our rivers don't really flood and recede in the same way as they used to. Um, the river can't move across the landscape anymore because we're trying to constrain it, sometimes by concrete walls, um, sometimes just the channel is very, very deep because maybe we've dredged it, we've dug out the silt uh, and the river is so low now that it only um, floods in really extreme circumstances, um, but it can't move across the landscape and change uh, and it alters the flow. Um, so it's not a natural flow system we've got anymore. Um, there are access issues. Um, people need to be able to access the river um, in the right way uh, and use it for recreation, uh, walking, hiking, paddling, so actually on the river. Um, as I've said, in terms of the canal, um, the link to the Grand Union Canal, um, canal boats um, use parts of the river saw for navigation 
you know, where it kind of joins up with the canal. This is a big issue. You can't fail to spot that if you're in and around Leicester and you're wandering along and there's um, and you kind of spot certain places where litter just accumulates. Uh, and this is just you know, people just littering and it, it's, there's no there's no excuse for it. Um, and there will be like litter and um, kind of other pollutants like that that have come from other areas and it could be to do with um, flooding times of water treatment works. Um, could be from industrial estates, um, but it's something that we really need to address. And actually, there are a lot of people out there working really hard. And I've visited a few local groups uh, in and around Leicester who are doing some great work on reducing the amount of litter and plastics in the water course. And then the final one there is phosphates. Uh, and this is an issue um, both from an agricultural perspective, phosphates get into the water um, as runoff, um, where farmers are applying nitrate, um, nitrates, uh, nitrate fertilizers to the soil um, to help the crops grow. Um, but if it's uh, if it can get off, if there's runoff, uh, if the soil runs off into the water, uh, then that will increase the phosphate level uh, and increases the nutrients within the water, which is just not good for most species. Um, it can allow problem species to thrive, uh, and that will then have a negative impact on other species. Phosphates will also come from wastewater treatment where um, the water that goes through our sewage and wastewater treatment plants isn't always completely stripped of phosphates. There's not always the technology in there um, for that to have happened. So um, reduction in phosphate use overall um, would be really key to improving our water quality in the River Saw and in the wider national catchment picture. So this is quite similar to, um, to other catchments that you'll see across the country. What about core sites being better connected? So this was the second of the uh, kind of overall objectives. So back to the purple Y shape again, hopefully you can um, see that. Uh, and there are some little, lots of little coloured squiggles within that purple Y this time. Uh, and that's essentially um, highlighting where there are sites in there that are either Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust nature reserves. So 10 of those blobs are our nature reserves, and that accounts for 240 hectares. 14 of those sites are sites of special scientific interest, and that's just over 500 hectares. Um, 30, uh, 343 of those little tiny blobs are local wildlife sites, and these are sites that don't have statutory protection, but they have been identified um, at the county level by experts to say these are sites that are of county importance. They do have some level of protection through the planning system, but they're really important for us to help understand where some of our best wildlife sites are. Um, sometimes they can be as good as our protected sites, um, but just haven't had that kind of same level of protection um, designated upon them. Um, but this is what we know um, to be out there. Um, and there are some clusters there. Um, there's some clusters around Cossington, there's some clusters around Aylston Meadows, just to the south of Leicester, if you know that at all. Um, but there's an awful lot of purple space. Uh, and kind of one of the things I'd really like to see is less purple space there and more multicolored uh, blobs that mean that actually the, the living landscape there is, is more, uh, more connected up. So those core sites that we've got, we're able to connect them uh, and provide some really high quality habitat in between. Now, priority habitats and species, um, we take our steer from this on a document called Space for Wildlife, the Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland Biodiversity Action Plan. Uh, and this is um, a partnership organisation, partnership organisations have come together to write this, including the Wildlife Trusts um, had in, input into this. Uh, it was written back in 2016. Uh, and this sets out um, the priority habitats and species for those counties. Uh, why we need to focus on particular species, and that could be because some are in particular decline. It could be because actually we've got um, a really important part of a resource, of a national resource. Um, it could be just because habitats are under threat and we need to um, be focused on prioritising those, those habitats there. So in terms of what is um, relevant in terms of priority habitat for um, the soil and reef living landscape, uh, it's probably no surprise to you that mostly it's to do with wetland habitats. It's floodplain wetlands, um, it's our really kind of good neutral grassland sites. Uh, and this is not a picture of the sort of meek um, at all. You may have, you may have spotted um, there are some cranes flying in there. Um, it's just a bit of a vision uh, and it's a picture that makes me smile because I think, wouldn't it be lovely if the sort of meek didn't landscape? The habitats were there in sufficient quantity and sufficiently connected enough um, that we could support cranes uh, in our area. Wouldn't that be amazing? In terms of priority species, um, again, kind of wetland, habit wetland habitat specialists you'll see there, otter, water vole, white club crayfish, various bats, um, birds there. We've got um, swift and swallows and house martins uh, and sand martins, barn owl, nightingale, um, black poplar, which is a tree associated with um, riverside habitats, 
uh, and there's a plant there called purple small weed. I wanted to just give you a bit of a picture of what we do know about three of those species in particular, because they will be a focus for me and my work going forward. And I'm trying to um, bring together a partnership uh, project um, that will be a big multi-species project that will help us to deliver some of the things we want to in the soil and the landscape. At the moment, there's really only me um, and obviously our partners involved. And what we'd like to do is be able to bring in some more um, staff who will be able to get out and about and look at three of these species in particular and how we can turn around um, their declines. So the first species that we'll be looking at in this project is barn owls. Uh, and this map, um, back to the purple Y shape again, um, what you can see, this is what we know about barn owl records. Um, and all the purple squares there are one kilometre grid squares where we've had a relatively recent record of barn owls. And all the orange squares uh, and where we've had a relatively recent record of barn owls breeding. Um, so what I really like is to have those squares um, connected up all throughout the habitat where, where there's, where there's um, suitable habitat for them, um, right in the centre of Leicester. That might be a little bit more tricky, but there are some really interesting uh, and large enough places for barn owls to um, be present. Um, mostly actually through the, the river corridor, as you think about um, anything through from kind of the Aylston area all the way through to the south there. Wouldn't it be great to turn all those purple squares uh, into that orange colour? So lots and lots of breeding records. Uh, and really, barn owls are not doing as badly as they were, um, but they were on the brink of extinction locally. So um, it's great to see this picture, but um, what we'd really like to do as part of the project is see how we can uh, make it an even better picture. The picture for swifts, so this is the same sort of map, so this time in purple there are breeding records and often our swifts are now associated with urban nesting locations um, and that could be our tall buildings in and around the city, houses, um, some of our churches, um, we've had successful installations of swift boxes in church towers uh, and that's something that we'll be trying to drive forward um, anywhere where there's a church tower can be a great location to get some swift boxes. If you know of a location where there are swifts already um, expanding that uh, and really building on existing populations and giving them the opportunity to expand. Um, so the majority of our swifts now are nesting in our urban locations. Uh, and there are other sightings of swifts pretty much across the living landscape, but let's see if we can't increase that uh, and do our bit to help these amazing creatures who uh, their migration story is just, uh, just incredible. And then the third species that we'd like to look at as part of the project um, really focused around our watercourses specifically and the health of our watercourses is water vole. Uh, and these are a species that have been um, declining rapidly and are still declining, uh, we understand it. Um, you can see the map here is much more scattered. Um, there are far fewer squares with sightings and some of those, um, they're, they're pretty old records when you start to think about you know, 20, 25 year old records there. Um, some more recent, um, but they're scattered, they're few and far between and they're not very connected up. So we'd like to have a better picture of what's going on with our water bowls in the Sorum Rig. Uh, and then see if we can't start to turn that around. Uh, and we really will need to make better space for waterfowl. There are lots of other pressures, uh, lots of reasons why they might be declining in terms of habitat, but also I mentioned right at the start about invasive species. Uh, and the, the species, that's the American mink, is one of the biggest um, threats to waterfowls. And so if we do want to see our waterfowl populations thriving and recovering, we may have to um, have a real um, long, hard think about um, what's the situation with mink in and around the catchment um, because unless we give them a real a real boost in terms of habitat for water bowl, um, the mink could be the deciding factor as to whether they, they uh, return um, to kind of real healthy thriving populations or not. So that's priority species from the biodiversity action plan but because the Solon Reek is a wetland area there'll be loads of other species that will be benefiting from any of the work that we do from our wading birds, dragonflies and damselflies, grass snakes and uh, other reptiles, amphibians, so great crested newts, fish in our streams like this bullhead, um, that's more of a, a fast flowing stream kind of fish, but they, they, they hopefully will be around in a catchment somewhere. And then our wetland plants as well, um, which will have a knock on um, beneficial impact if we've got more flowering species, um, will be brilliant for pollinators as well. And then we're on to uh, number four, I think, on our um, list of aspirations, our kind of our overarching aims. Uh, and this is about our communities being better connected uh, in lots of different ways. So maybe um, our communities are involved in habitat creation. Uh, and this could be just helping and guiding people and supporting them to create ponds um, or to create pollinator habitat in their local communities. 
Um, so there's lots of really small habitat creation actions that communities can take that would really benefit and add to the picture for the Soaring Week. There's lots of really big ones as well, but that relies on us having a lot of land available. Habitat management, people can get involved either on Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust reserves if they want to get stuck in and learn how, how we manage our habitats. Um, but also potentially, again, in your local environment, if you find a local patch that's a bit um, unloved or overmanaged, uh, and you get the opportunity to get involved in managing it better for wildlife, um, then that can be a really great opportunity. Education, uh, any time that we can maybe uh, increase um, what people know about the habitats and species around them. Um, there's a great phrase um, from David Attenborough who says people will only uh, care about what they know about, um, or words to that effect. So people need to understand better um, the natural environment and that can help people to understand it and then to care about it and want to do something about it. And then recreation, making sure that people have opportunity um, to connect um, with the soil and the landscape, with these rivers um, and, and use it for recreation, whether that's walking, as I mentioned before, kayaking or um, stand up paddle boarding, um, just bringing all those health and wellbeing benefits of people being outside and access to nature and access to these blue spaces, these riverside spaces um, can be really important, uh, kind of an added value uh, experience of not just being outside in nature, but um, having those rivers and streams as well, um, just brings an extra dimension. So a community is better connected up. But how do we do all of this? Let me just see how I'm doing for time. Okay, eight o'clock, so halfway through or so. How do we achieve our objectives? Uh, well, we've got some principles that we'd like to follow and um, that will help us decide um, how to, to get where we want to go. And the first of these is about using natural processes to help habitats recover. Um, so we're hoping to see if we can get nature to do its thing uh, and give it the opportunity to. And I'll talk a little bit more about the work in the water portion of this in a moment. Um, but there's other things like grazing, which is a natural process. Um, if you think about any kind of wilderness, um, uh, there would be grazing animals um, that would be nature's habitat managers. And um, so potentially sometimes reducing management uh, and just, just letting nature do its thing a little bit more. We definitely will need to work in partnership to achieve more. We can't do it on our own. Um, we have, as Leicestershire and Rutland, I think it's 35 nature reserves, um, but um, that's only a really quite a small proportion of the area um, across the whole of Leicestershire and Rutland, um, and an even smaller proportion of the soil and the landscape. But what we do do is work with the county, district and parish councils, um, other nature partnerships, I mentioned the Soil Catchment Partnership, there's the River Soil and Grand Union Canal Partnership as well, um, um, businesses uh, and landowners directly and indirectly we can certainly get out and just talk to people, advise them uh, and see if we can't work together to identify opportunities where we can do some really good habitat creation, uh, working in partnership and all bringing different things to the partnership and um, to achieve very, uh, very similar outcomes. It's what we're all trying to achieve is, is better quality water uh, better quality water habitat uh, and whether that's from our perspective as for wildlife and um, some of the other um, partners might be have a different perspective in terms of perhaps recreation or the canal specifically um, but we're all ultimately working uh, in a similar way and um, we need to work together bring in funding together and actually then we can achieve more. We need to make sure we um, don't lose sight of what's the impact of what we're doing and um, so surveying and monitoring um, to find out is what we're doing working um, what is happening to our species? Um, we can give a general picture, but it's really hard without um, dedicated survey and monitoring um, to really see on a year to year basis. Um, are these species going up? Are they going down? Are they relatively stable? Um, so we can carry out site visits. Um, we can get involved in regular monitoring and get volunteers involved in regular monitoring uh, and make sure we share data and share our records, places like Nature Spot and the Record Centre. And so that actually we've got this adding to the picture across uh, the counties of Leicestershire and Rutland. And in turn, those um, organisations will share records nationally um, so we can better understand uh, um, what is happening with our wildlife. And that helps at a national level to put more pressure on the government um, to really set some, um, some challenging objectives um, for nature's recovery. Uh, and it absolutely has to happen. So we can play our part in starting that, that picture off. And then the fourth way to achieve our objectives is to enable communities to take action for themselves. Um, so this is by providing advice, signposting to information, perhaps providing training and education, and hopefully bringing people together. So arranging conferences and, and events where people can get together, share information, share knowledge, 
Um, so the living landscape approach is very much about people getting together and taking action and learning from each other. Um, there's only so much um, that as, as the Wildlife Trust we can do out in the wider countryside. You see, we're working on our own nature reserves as well. Uh, and then we've got a really tiny team trying to look across the rest of the county. Um, so very much about helping and supporting others um, to take action uh, and just signposting them in the right way uh, and giving them the right tools um, to, to make a difference in their own communities. So I said we'd talk a bit more about the working with water part of this. Uh, and there's a specific example um, I wanted to run through. But I also wanted to just tip, tip, put, put up one more slightly complicated slide. Uh, and this is um, it's kind of, to my mind, it's all about upstream thinking. So it's all about this bit at the top of the catchment. So where water falls originally at the top of the hill and starts to make its way down the valley. And this is where we can have a really big impact in slowing the flow of water. When it rains, slow the flow of water off the steeper land by putting in um, drainage management, more woodland, more leaky barriers within the water, um, just to slow it all down, catch that water, help to infiltrate, and that can have a positive impact on flows and flooding further down in the middle of the catchment. Still opportunities to store water here and increase infiltration, perhaps allow the floodplains to be reconnected so that water can move more naturally. And then way on down to the, the lower end of the catchment where you've got um, the kind of the delta floodplain, the coastal process is happening. So this is the Humber estuary or the wash. This is the area where the water ends up and anything we do in terms of upstream will benefit what's going on uh, downstream. So uh, I think we've got time. I'm going to show you one of these two videos. And uh, if anyone's interested, I'll provide the link to the other one and link to the, the full set of these videos. Um, these are two, um, I don't want to call them toys, but <laughs> they're sand pits. And I've had the pleasure of having a bit of a play with them at a couple of events in the past. But they're really good tools to demonstrate what happens with water and the catchment. Uh, and if you change uh, how you um, work with water in the upper catchment, what impact it can have on the lower catchment. And the one I'm going to show you is related to the picture on the right here. So if you can picture a big box with sand in it, uh, and this is a fantastic, it's that it's a combined sand pit and some wizardry with um, technology. So you can move the sand around. Somebody there has moved the sand around and created kind of two areas uh, and then overlaid on top as a projector and it's projecting those contour lines that you can see in the different colours. And then when the lady on the presentation puts her hand over the camera at the top, you'll see the blue arrives and that's the rain. And it's not real water, but it's rain and you'll see how it moves through the catchment. Uh, and she'll be explaining kind of a bit of this, this concept, this upstream thinking and the things that can happen um, when you just make small changes higher up in a catchment and what impact that can have on the lower catchment. So while I'm chatting, I'm just gonna stop that screen share and see if I can't queue up um, the, the next part of um, what I'm trying to find. So just give me one second to um, get the right, um, get the right screen up. Um, I'd say talk amongst yourselves, but actually there's probably not many of you in the same place to be talking amongst yourselves. Um, so uh, let me just see if I can't come back um, to the right place. And um, we will share this one. Okay, so hopefully um, you can see um, the sand pit and I'm gonna press play uh, and we'll see if this bit of technology works. So what we've created here is two contrasting catchments. They've both got roughly the same gradient from the top of the catchment down to the bottom of the catchment. But as you can see, this one here has got a much straighter channel. It's also got very straight, steep tributaries feeding into that channel. Um, and there's a settlement that we've put at the bottom there. So those little Lego bricks are representing houses. This side of the catchment is a much more naturalised looking catchment. We've got a meandering river channel. We've got some trees planted around. We've got some woody debris in some of the channels. We've also got small little runoff attenuation features. And what we're going to do is introduce rain into both of these catchments and see how quickly the water flows down the catchment and how much is actually stored in the upland areas of the catchment. So you can see that in the straight catchment, the water's moved and it's already at the bottom of the catchment. It had quite a lot of velocity, it moved really quickly and it's flooded that settlement. In the more naturalised catchment with a meandering channel, water is taking a lot longer to reach the bottom. 
That's because the gradient of the channel is a lot shallower because it's got further to travel. We can also see that in the more naturalized catchment, there's quite a lot of water that's staying up in the catchment and is being stored by some of the little features that we talked about earlier. To reduce the risk of flooding in the settlement at the bottom of the catchment, we can build engineered flood defences. We can just represent these with some Lego bricks here to position those in. Then if we rain on the catchment again, we can see what difference that those make. So you can see that that wall has now protected the settlement from flooding. As well as introducing engineered defences to reduce the risk of flooding downstream, we can also slow the flow of water in the upstream catchment areas by introducing various measures such as creating storage areas, introducing leaky dams and planting trees. So we'll just rain on this catchment again and see what difference that's made. So you can see that the woody debris and the leaky dams that we've put in the channel are slowing the flow, they're reconnecting the floodplain to the channel and we can also see that there's quite a lot of blue in the upland areas of the catchment showing that we've managed to store some water further upstream. So I hope you managed to see that um, uh, presentation okay. Uh, I'm just going to come back to my PowerPoint presentation and see if I can't uh, set it up again from the current slide. So where were we? We were there. So it's kind of um, a bit of an indulgent way of playing with sand pits. It's always something I enjoyed as a kid. Um, and now you can play with sand pits as an adult. Uh, and it just really helps you understand that concept of slowing the flow, uh, working with natural processes and using natural materials sometimes alongside engineered structures, um, but to help slow the flow of water as it moves through a catchment. And it's something that we've been involved in as Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust at our Narbra Bog Nature Reserve, which is to the south of the county. Uh, let me just check, uh, make sure. I just realised I'm not sharing my screen, so I do apologise. Let me just come back, reshare my screen. That's the one. There we go. So it's something um, that um, we've been working on at our Narbra Bog Nature Reserve, this idea of natural flood management. And this was a partnership project. So the Soil Catchment Partnership was involved, the Environment Agency were involved, uh, and a company called Atkins as well. And we'll hear from them in a little moment. Um, but Narbra Bog Nature Reserve to the south of Leicester. Um, it's, um, it's, it's a bog habitat. It's a peat bog. It's only a very small fragment. Uh, and one of the key issues from a wildlife perspective and from a habitat perspective is it is drying out, not wet enough, but it's right next to the River Saw. Um, so um, what the project did was looked at ways of actually uh, re-wetting the peat there uh, and actually having the added benefit of slowing the flow of water into Leicester um, by allowing some of it to flood into the Narborough Bog Nature Reserve. So it's a really good partnership project. Um, it was in place just before um, COVID hit and there is going to be some monitoring going on to find out about the impact of it. Um, but um, it's something that we'd like to replicate across other areas of the catchment if we can find opportunities to do this. Uh, and if I can make the slides move on now. There we go. So I've got one more video for you um, that I'd like to play. And so if you bear with me while I cue that up. Uh, and this one's about four minutes. Uh, and it talks about um, not only... Um, the, the project at Narborough Bog, but it starts the talk at um, one of uh, the other sites that's doing something very similar, but I think it gives a really good explanation of the whole idea of natural flood management, uh, and it's just over in Norfolk. Um, but it's, so it's, it's just four and a half minutes, this bit, so we'll watch this uh, and then we'll come back um, to the presentation. We know that flood resilience is like a jigsaw, with many different pieces needing to come together to complete the picture. Natural flood management is an increasingly important part of resilience 
and it's an area that Atkins have been working in for over 10 years. Louise Beale went to see two of their projects to find out more. To the untrained eye, this section of the River Wenson in North Norfolk may look like any other. Yet this stretch of water is actually very significant. It's part of the most advanced river restoration project in the UK. The scheme uses nature-based techniques to help reduce downstream flooding. Those behind the project say it also helps improve natural habitats. We've employed a lot of techniques to improve the habitat uh, condition and the habitat complexity of the river. From quite significant bed raising, where we have put material back into the channel, which was historically removed as a result of dredging activity, to much smaller measures such as creating low level burns, which just act to constrict the flow at key locations to improve the flow character to target plant and animal communities in line with the river's important uh, national and international designation. The project has been running for 10 years and covers over 70 kilometres of watercourse. Around 30 kilometres have been worked on so far. As part of the restoration scheme here, they've been using many different techniques, including some quite simple ones, like putting a large piece of wood into the river to change the flow of the water and create lots of different habitats around it. Here in Norfolk, the scheme has had a significant impact on the wider community too. The main aim for the drainage board of this project was to really improve the ecology of the river and to bring it for, to a more favourable condition under the water framework directive. The byproduct is that through narrowing the river, we reduce the amount of silt that is deposited along its length. And that actually reduces the amount of maintenance we have to do and focuses it on certain areas. So not only is there ecological improvements, there's also improvements with our maintenance. There's improvements for the wider environment and ecology of the area, and also for um, the flood risk benefits that have come about through slowing flow in the upper region. The learnings made on the River Wenton are being put to use on other projects, including this recently completed one in Leicestershire on the River Saw. Here they are also using technology to monitor how effective the natural flood management features they put in actually are. Behind us you'll see there are sensors upstream and downstream of the feature, what we're trying to understand is how that wood that you see behind you is actually slowing the flow of water during a flood. And obviously the other thing as well is we can't really get out here to measure things safely during a flood. So actually having this technology is also helping us capture much more information to be honest than we would have been able to do any other way. The scheme here is part of the largest natural flood management program of work for the Environment Agency. They're hoping it will help protect local people from flooding. We're in changing times. We've got a climate emergency. Carbon has been talked about a lot more. Um, we know that we just can't keep building walls ever higher and higher. So we've got to look for other solutions. And natural flood management and other nature-based solutions are really just part of the jigsaw in what we can use to try and tackle flood risk, but also improve water quality and restore habitat as well. The River Saw project has been embraced by those protecting wildlife here, as it's close to the unique nature reserve, the Narba Bog. Not only are we helping people who live downstream tend to be protected from flooding in the waters, the action of water, but also we're, you know, we're positively having an impact on biodiversity and wildlife. I'm able to kind of communicate to new audiences about maybe finding out how that fits in on their land, talking with other landowners and farmers and seeing how this could be appropriately delivered elsewhere as well. The data and learnings being gathered here are vital for the future. The team hope by early next year they'll have a fuller picture of how helpful the measures have been, not just for people, but for the environment too. Okay, thank you for your patience and watching that. Hopefully that's given you a bit of a, a wider picture and just a rest for a few moments from me talking specifically. Uh, and let me just come back to share my screen again and make sure I get the right one this time. Okay, I think it's this one. So that was the quick whiz round, uh, the Storm Reap Living Landscape and some of our aspirations and, and the way we would like to be working there. 
Um, but I just thought a very quick flavour of what's going on along the rest of the county, some of this you may be more familiar with. Um, the one special protection area that we're um, helping to oversee at Rutland Water, two national nature reserves, 20 sites of special scientific interest and 10 ancient woodlands. Um, so we're scattered uh, across Leicestershire and Rutland. Um, wouldn't it be great if there were loads more badgers on the map there? And that is certainly an aspiration um, for us to be able to um, purchase and manage more land across the counties, more land for nature. Um, but equally, we want to be helping to influence those um, in the gaps in between our reserves to increase that connectivity that I spoke about at the start. We've got wildlife, we've got people, we've got grazing on and off our reserves, we've got um, volunteer work days, we've got education sessions, we've got something called forest school, which um, I would have loved to go to as a child, uh, and I'm hoping to get to one of the forest school sessions, um, but teaching our kids from an early age as possible um, how cool it is to be outside and to be embracing nature. So loads of stuff going on. You'll probably be more familiar than I am even with what's going on at Rutland, um, but it is part of that bigger picture, the ospreys, bird fair, um, the habitat work is going on at Rutland itself. And our trainee reserves officers, we get a new cohort in every year uh, and help to train up future conservationists um, before they spread their wings and go out uh, into the rest of the world, uh, fully trained up, having been a part of Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust and our activities. So in terms of living landscapes, Sawan Reek is not the only one. We're working in the Charwood Forest, um, but the whole of kind of Leicestershire and Rutland um, could be divided into different living landscape areas, depending on mostly kind of the underlying geology has a big impact on the habitats. Um, but so it's not an isolated um, scheme in itself. So the living landscape of the Sawan Reek is connected up to the rest of Leicestershire and Rutland. And further afield, we're part of this network of 47 local wildlife trusts. Uh, and together the Wildlife Trusts have over two and a half thousand nature reserves and a combined membership of 800,000. Um, so we're in this unique position where we are a local organisation, um, working on local conservation with local people um, and we're in this kind of locality. But we do have this backing of, of national um, organisations uh, and other counties around us. So working with our um, neighbours, uh, kind of our sister trusts, um, all around us can help us to have that even bigger impact. We need to kind of um, take that network approach all the way up uh, in terms of perhaps the Humber River, River Basin District that I spoke about quite early on that um, encompasses um, Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire, Lincolnshire, um, bits of Yorkshire as well. So um, having that kind of big scale thinking is really important. And then I'd just like to finish with a bit of a, a call to action. Um, you might be sitting there um, thinking, this is great, there's loads of really interesting things here, but what about what could I do? What can I go out and do tomorrow um, that would help in this um, kind of this, this effort to turn around nature's decline and turn it into nature recovery? So I just picked five things, five really easy things um, that you could potentially take away with you. If you're going to do anything, um, first and foremost, see if you can make more space for nature. And that could be as simple as if you've got a bit of outside space, create a pond. And there's nothing better than to provide water for wildlife. Those of you familiar with Rutland water will know how alive it is with all sorts of different species. So if you can replicate that on a miniature scale, um, either in your home or somewhere local to you where there might be space, you can put pressure on um, a local group to get together and, and create yourselves a wildlife pond. Um, really, really good thing you can do. The second one there, leave your garden wild. Um, so this, is, this action is do nothing. It's actually a, a, an inaction action, if you like. Um, so if it's if it's summer and you're thinking, oh, I should really be cutting the lawn, don't. Maybe one afternoon, instead of cutting the lawn, get the deck chair out, kick back with a drink uh, and just watch wildlife buzzing around. So leave things a little bit more messy, cut your lawn a bit less often, find that little back corner of your yard that can, um, that can stay messy and be a bit wilder. And I think over the coming weeks and months, you might hear more about this concept of wilder. Um, you've probably heard about rewilding as an idea. Um, I like to think you can rewild anywhere um, just by doing a bit less and allowing nature just to take over a bit uh, and embrace the messy. The third thing you can do that's really important is to go peat free. Um, we really need to stop digging out peat, stop taking that resource out of our uplands often uh, because that's where we need the peat to be absorbing water and to be storing carbon for us. So storing water in terms of slowing the flow, absolutely vital, uh, and storing carbon is 
also it's absolutely vital in our efforts to um, reduce the impact of climate change and help kind of stem these trends towards uh, a warming climate uh, and releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere so let's see if we can't um, do our bit by just saying no to using peat and compost there's lots of online uh, information that you can pick up on this next point about taking action for insects our pollinators are in a steep decline and the picture isn't great for insects, but there's loads of stuff you can do um, to take action for insects. Uh, and if you're interested, just go online and, and look up action for insects on our website and you'll see there's a raft of things you can do, creating a pond, even your garden wild or two of those things. Um, but getting together within your community and seeing if you can't um, provide some more space for pollinator habitat um, in and around verges, um, in a churchyard perhaps, they maybe influence that getting a little bit wilder. Um, rather than being mown so often, put pressure on your local council. Do they really need to mow the park um, every two weeks all summer? Maybe they could leave a bit of it for nature. So get involved in that way. Uh, and if you're not already volunteering and you fancy getting stuck in with Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust, pop onto our website and you can find out about ways that you can get involved by volunteering for the Trust. So I think right on time of uh, in around the hour or so, um, we're on to the questions part of the evening. So hopefully you're all still with me. I uh, apologise for the slight um, gaps in terms of um, technology and making that all work, but I hope you've all managed to um, uh, capture what I've been talking about uh, and uh, make sure you've been able to um, hear everything okay. Uh, and it's time for me to stop sharing uh, and to come back in and see um, if there's been any questions that were, any comments that people would like to make and have a bit of a chat um, for the rest of the time this evening. Thank you very much, Claire. That was um, that was really interesting because obviously you're at a relatively early stage in the um, uh, in the in the project, but it, it's quite it's quite illuminating when you um, when you map out the. Uh, the, the water courses in the two areas of the of county Leicestershire and Rutland, uh, just how different they are and how extensive they are. And I think um, I think we're all a little bit surprised. You can look at an ordnance survey map, but actually you don't appreciate uh, just how many um, streams and tributaries there are until you until you've blocked them in like like you have done. Thank yeah. you very much indeed. Um, I'm not sure whether we've got any um, questions. I'm not quite sure how how this works unless it works through chat no it doesn't so is there a q and a oh yes there is a q and a here um but we haven't got any any ones at, at the moment it looks as though everybody's everybody's really really happy with that <laughs> stunned silence perhaps well, <laughs> Yes, there's well, we've got one here, Claire. Just hang on a second. A live from the VTC. Wow, a live in person question. Brilliant. Has Claire actually um, had time to identify suitable areas about connecting up about, I think one of the large slide she showed was the areas of the trap holes? And has she identified possible areas that they could acquire? to make the connection. Sorry, I'm not sure whether you caught that very well. Have you, have you identified any areas in your... In the landscape. In the landscape that you could join, you know, that, that need joining up. Yeah, and that could possibly buy... Could, could, could the trust acquire. Oh, and that, oh yes, yeah. and that, yeah. that we might be able to acquire as a trust, yeah. <laughs> Um, have I identified any all of them? I'd love to have all of them. Um, the, the, the real answer to that is I don't have any specific areas yet, um, but my kind of call to everybody is to um, let us know, really. Um, be our eyes and ears on the ground. So if you hear that there might be something coming up for sale, there might be an opportunity, um, then do please get in touch and let us know. As a trust, we will be participating in and indeed leading on um, setting up a... Um, and more of a mapping exercise to do just that kind of thing uh, and developing, I spoke about the nature recovery network uh, and we'll be developing, each county will be developing a, a local nature recovery strategy that will include that kind of mapping element where we look at exactly which parcels of land might be suitable. Um, but obviously we can't um, make anybody sell it to us. 
Uh, we can't make anybody change how they manage the land, but it would be great if we could start conversations with anybody um, who might be interested. Um, but pretty much I could look at any of the parcels of land in between where, um, where we have existing sites uh, and to say, yes, from an aspirational perspective, any of those might work. Um, in reality, um, I haven't been out on the ground. I haven't really been here long enough um, to get to know the locals and the local landowners. So I'll be very much reliant on local communities and I'll be talking with parishes and trying to get them together to help me to map those areas exactly uh, and say, actually, do you know what? There's a landowner there who I think might be interested uh, in, um, in selling or in talking to you. And so I'll be very much reliant on people coming uh, and maybe giving me a heads up so I can go and have a chat to people uh, and see if I can not investigate whether there are opportunities and how we might take those sort of opportunities forward. Thanks, that's very much ear to the ground then. It is, yes. Um, I'd love to say, yes, I've got a list of, of 10 sites we want to have a go at, um, but uh, that's an aspiration. Uh, it's not quite the reality of where we are at the moment. Okay. Um, one question, is there any, is there some work being done on the soaring corn at the moment? And if so, what, what is being done? Um, I haven't been to visit Quorn in that area. Um, I believe the Trust has um, uh, done some work there previously. Um, so I don't know, it's a short answer, I'm sorry, uh, exactly what's going on there. But if anybody has specific contacts in Quorn um, or something they've got that they know of particularly, do get in touch and, and start the conversation. And I can come out and visit and chat to people, have a look around, have a wander around uh, and, and see how we can help. Okay, thank you. Um, Sharon asks, um, I think it's back to the project again, how are you going to measure the impact of the project? That's really tricky. Um, measuring impact is a, is a difficult thing. Um, we can look at area of land overall um, and see if we can increase the area of land that's being managed for nature. Uh, and that relies on us keeping really accurate records and understanding what we call the baseline of where we are now. Um, trying to um, set up some more regular species monitoring um, so we can understand what might be happening in terms of species. Uh, and we can measure the number of people we talk to uh, and we can get them to tell us if they're taking action as a result of what we're talking about uh, and try and measure that way. So there's different ways. We can try and measure um, how people feel about the local environment and see if we can um, measure if that changes over time as a result of what we're doing. So when you set up any project, this is more of a programme of projects. So each individual project that we might come up with, hopefully we'll be able to set up at the outset. What do we want to see and how are we going to measure that? Uh, and there are different ways. You can use questionnaires to ask people how they felt about participation. But then obviously you can measure um, in terms of land use and the areas that you're talking about and the areas that you're influencing. And then hopefully also you can see what's happening in terms of the species. But that happens over a period of years, not necessarily um immediately so you have to be prepared to be able to monitor long term to see real change hi it's becky there's a couple of more questions if you can hear me yes one of them is with the huge drive behind housing developments what work are you doing with builders and housing developers to encourage them to put a portion of their development into planning for non-profit Absolutely. Um, at the moment, we don't have huge capacity to work um, on individual planning applications. Um, but um, one of the things that I spoke about the Environment Bill I mentioned briefly earlier that is coming in. Uh, and once this comes in, it will become mandatory for development to provide biodiversity net gain. Uh, and this means it will be mandatory for every development to leave the site with a better biodiversity outcome than it started with. So to provide a net gain. Um, so we will be um, looking very closely at major developments and making sure that they adhere to this net gain um, once it becomes uh, mandatory through the Environment Bill. Um, but also we would encourage local people, if you've got particular applications you're concerned about, um, then let us know and we can provide advice. Um, it'd be great to try and work with some of the, the housing developers themselves. It's not always easy to get in there um, and get talking to them. But simple things like putting swift boxes up on every house um, and uh, just kind of making space for that one species can be a real big game. 
Um, but we're certainly, um, I'm certainly quite excited about this idea of biodiversity net gain because if, it, if it's done properly, um, it should result in a much better outcome uh, in terms of development and biodiversity than we've seen for a long time. Um, that there'll be at least 10% more habitat and this will be better habitat um, than was there. So they won't be able to chop down woodland and replace it with a bit of something, a bit of rubbish grassland. Um, if, they're, um, if they're allowed to remove woodland, they will be replacing it with woodland. Um, if uh, any grassland is lost, it will be replaced with higher quality grassland. Um, so that's something to look out for um, going forward. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. Uh, it's going to have to be carefully monitored, I think. Um, yes, definitely. Um, linked with that, really, uh, David asks, uh, will there be funding from government under the new Environment Bill to encourage landowners in nature's recovery? So yeah, it's tricky to say um, if that's uh, it's not not necessarily directly, um, but the things that will provide funding. So biodiversity net gain will provide some funding because if developers can't provide that on site, there will be some money for off site mitigation. That's only as a last resort. It's worth bearing in mind. Uh, and the other thing is the new environmental stewardship scheme that is in development currently. So over the next seven years farmers and landowners will be transitioning to a new scheme, whereas before they were kind of paid for how much land they had, essentially. Um, there will be much more emphasis on um, only paying for uh, landowners who are providing services, um, so including natural services for wildlife, so making sure that water, wetland habitats, uh, grassland habitats uh, are working um, for us and in good condition. So that's another way that landowners will be able to access funding is by starting to take up these new stewardship schemes um, as they come uh, on board. Currently, um, they can still apply to countryside stewardship, um, as has been the case for the last few years, but it's transitioning over the next a period of seven years to give enough time for it all to bed in. So there is, we're in a period of change um, with that, with kind of leaving the, um, the EU uh, and with the new environment bill um, with um, changes in countryside stewardship. So there's a lot going on, development of local nature recovery strategies, um, it's a time of flux, but hopefully a time of real opportunity um, for nature uh, and just, yeah, so uh, hopefully a real positive time ahead of us. Thank you. Another live question from, from the VTC here. Hello, it's Linda here. Um, Hi. You talked about the three species that you're sort of starting your project with, and you said you were going to start with the barn owl. What, have you actually started doing surveys for bear on owls and what exactly are you planning on doing? So the project is still in its development phase um, and as with many of these big projects because it's a multi-species thing um, it's going to take us a while to get the project bid and it sounds quite complicated and it is because if we're working over three or four years we've got to be very detailed in our application um, to make sure we can get some funding. So the short answer is we haven't, I haven't started doing any new monitoring, um, but I have been um, asking the record centre to share their records so I can get a picture of what is currently known. Uh, and then going forward, um, we'll be hoping that local people will be able to um, be trained up to record um, sightings uh, and be able to submit those sightings so that we have a good picture of what's going on across the landscape. In terms of what we would actually want to do with barn owl, it's again, it's quite a difficult picture. We want to provide more habitat for them in terms of nesting habitat, um, but we need to make sure that's associated with, re, um, with foraging habitat. So there's no point putting a box, another barn owl box up if there's no hunting habitat nearby, because um, that just won't support breeding barn owls. Um, so the idea is to work with landowners to potentially um, see how we can provide more habitat, um, uh, as well as um, providing more boxes but also to work with planning and development teams and highways teams so they have a better understanding of um, how they manage land um, that can impact on barn owls. For example, um, if they're managing roadside hedgerows and roadside verges, um, actually that can sometimes, if they're managing them um, in a certain way, that can increase the incidence of barn owl and, and road traffic collisions. If barn owls haven't got the habitat in the wider countryside and they're coming to road verges, um, if the hedgerows are quite low, barn owls can kind of get over onto those verges easily, but then uh, there's the potential impact um, of road traffic collisions and deaths in that way. Whereas actually if the hedgerows are higher and the land on the other side is in better condition, they're not forced to forage near roads so much. So um, 
it's, it's quite a, a tricky, complicated um, kind of picture, but we're hoping to work on multiple fronts um, uh, to understand better what's, what's the state of our barn owls and what can we do to um, boost the populations. Thank you. Um, and another question here. <laughs> this is a good one. What's the biggest challenge you face in achieving your objectives? Oh, one biggest challenge, I guess, is is, um, is it's only me, and um, I'm, you know, I'm I'm sort of trying to share the message and persuade people. So I guess getting enough people who are willing to take a punt uh, and to make make and take some action. Um, I guess that's the challenge for me is, is to get a real team of people who are taking action across the across the area. Um, because if the will is there, um, then everything else should follow on. Thank you, Claire. Well, I think that's probably all the time we've got we've got now. Um, thank you very much indeed for um, joining us tonight. Um, I know we had a little technical problem, but that was only here, so, so I'm sure everybody at home was okay. Yes. Um, we've thoroughly enjoyed it all. Um, it just shows, I think, it reflects on um, the skills and, and knowledge of of the um, uh, of the conservation. to use all this knowledge and get all these projects under, underway. We're very, very pleased to hear all about it. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for having me and for listening. Uh, and if anybody does want to get in touch afterwards, do feel free to get in touch with me via the Trust uh, if you've got any further questions or want to get involved. So do shout out and thank you for having me this evening. That's a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, thank everybody. Thank you. Uh, before everybody just disappear, um, Sorry, our next, our next meeting for the Rutland Group is on November the 19th. And it's um, Sarah Lambert, who's talking about uh, the botany of um, South Lincolnshire and Cambridgeshire. So join us uh, Monday the 19th, 7.30. We're going to be at the VTC, but we're also going to Zoom and hopefully this time we'll get the projects to work. Thanks a lot. Good night. Thanks. Thank you.